you want a behind the scenes look about what it takes to run a natural movement footwear brand? Well, you have come to the right place. We'll be doing that today on this episode of the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body starting feet first. You know, those things at the end of your legs. And as you may know, we break down the propaganda, the mythology, sometimes the outright lies you've been told about what it takes to run or walk or hike or play or do yoga or CrossFit, whatever you like to do, and do those things enjoyably and efficiently and effectively. Did I say enjoyably? Don't answer. It's a trick question. I know <laughs> I did. So I always say that because look, if you're not having a good time, do something different until you are. We're not going to keep it up if you're not. Mm -hmm. I am Stephen Sashin, your host of the Movement Movement Podcast. We call it the Movement Movement because we, including you and everybody here, are creating a movement about natural movement. More about that in a second. Basically, we want to make sure that you know you can do what you enjoy by getting out of the way, letting your body do what it's made to do, not interfering with that. And the part where you're involved, the first part of the movement movement is just spread the word. Give us a great review, a thumbs up, a like in the appropriate place, hit the bell icon on YouTube, go to our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find all the previous episodes, all the places you can find us on social media, and of course, other places to find the podcast if you don't like the one that you found it on now, which seems kind of odd, but I said it anyway. And I think that's, in short, look, if you want to be part of the tribe, just subscribe. So let us jump in. Golden Harper, welcome. Tell Thank people you. who you are and what you're doing here. Uh, I'm Golden Harper. Uh, we already established that. Yeah, part. we established that. Uh, <laughs> I am a runner, coach, uh, exercise science guy, uh, founder of Ultra, creator of Ultra originally, and PR gear, and uh, running technique guru of sorts. Oh, you can keep going. We got plenty of time. Yeah, we can, we can go on and on, but that's... So that's good for now. So let's start with the ultra part uh, for people who don't know. I mean, you and I have a similar thing in that I am the quote face of this brand. You were really the face of ultra. And so why don't we start with the part that most people probably don't know, which is the uh, what led to doing that and what made you kind of take that leap from the beginnings that I'm hinting about, because I know about them, to actually saying, hey, let's start a footwear company, the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. What I always say as the quickest way to go homeless. Um, <laughs> well, didn't I tell you what um, um, the guys that I met like seven months in said to us? No. So these are guys who've been in footwear for like 35 years, and they sat down at our kitchen table uh, with me and Lena and said, we believe in you guys. We believe in what you're doing. And we would start this with you, but we've been in footwear so long that we're not stupid enough to try and start a shoe company. So our guys basically told us the same thing. And neither so, of us listened. Yeah, exactly. Um, All right, so then back up. Yeah. Prior to actually starting, uh, what led to that happening? Geez, so much. I mean, I, I was born in shoes, born in footwear. Um the baby, uh, the baby picture show that not born with shoes on, but, uh, you know, from a, a, a career standpoint, my dad was working for Nike when I was born left there because they were unethical, immoral, you know, basically terrible people. Um, and went to Saucony till I was about nine. And then what was he doing, uh, he was a, um, uh, for Saucony. Yeah. Well, he, for either he, he was a paid product tester for Nike. So he had to run a hundred miles a week. <laughs> And they, this was when they put the air in the shoes for the first time and they all got injured, all the testers. Right. And they all felt like they were running 150 miles a week, which is not sustainable. And so they all wrote in and said, whatever you do, don't put this in running shoes. And wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, you know, they came back and said, yeah, we got your feedback, but we're going to make billions off this. The marketing is just too strong. Sorry. You know, and my dad said every tester he knew, essentially, they all quit at the yeah. time because they just couldn't do it. Um, and also, you know, they had an acknowledgement from the company that, hey, we understood your concern. We know you're all getting injured and we just frankly don't care because we're going to make lots of money off of it. And so his thought was they're knowingly injuring people. Um, well, his thought was uh, prescient because have you looked on the Run Fearless page in the last couple of months? I on don't think I have. It actually shows uh, a portion of the abstract of a study that never actually got peer reviewed published. But basically in the Zoom Structure 22, in a 12-week half marathon training program that they developed, 30.3% of the people got injured in that shoe. And of course, as you know, injury rates go up over time. Yep. Um, and in the React Infinity Run, quote, only 14.5%. Right. So they demonstrated that shoes can cause injuries and different shoes cause injuries at different levels. But no one has picked up on that in a way that would complain about that. And someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, they said, why do you think they even published it? And it suddenly hit me. 
my suspicion is it's for the same reason there's a warning label on cigarette boxes. That they're concerned at some point someone's going to go after them. And then they go, but we published it. But we published it. Yeah. So we, we showed that this shoe reliably injures one in three of you. Yeah. This one only in, in one a short period of time. And this one only one in six or yeah. seven of you. Yeah. Yeah. Piece of cake. No big deal. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, so he, I know. Uh, so he left Nike, moved to Saucony and doing a similar thing there. Uh, Western sales manager covered Colorado, Colorado. California, uh, Canada, Mexico. Okay. Basically, I didn't see him much. You know, I was really young though. So. So you didn't know what it looked like anyway. It's yeah. like, here's a picture. It's like, okay, good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he he stopped doing that because he felt like he needed to be a, around us more. I and so, appreciate that. And then we opened the shoe store when I was nine. So um, so he learned nothing from being a salesperson. Correct. <laughs> yeah, he learned that he, this man loves running more than anybody I've ever met. And yeah. I've met all kinds of World runners, champions. at least on par with everybody I've ever met. Um, just loves running, loves everything about it. And so I started working there at age nine. I started being left there alone at age 10. So 10, you're like man in the cash register. and Yeah, because really five dudes with 500 bucks started the store and worked their day off of their real job. You know? um, and when somebody couldn't, you know, make it, I would get left there for odd hours, you know. And when you're left in a running store as a 10 year old, you better have chops for one and you better know your stuff. And luckily I had, I had had some running success and I was a shoe nerd to the nth degree. So was there ever a time, um, you maybe think of something that happened to me when I was 10, I got really into hypnosis when I was like eight. Mm. And I remember having a conversation with a friend of the family who was a, uh, the head of, um, uh, anesthesiology at a big New York hospital. We're all having dinner and we're, he and I are talking about the clinical applications of hypnosis for anesthesia. And in the middle of the conversation, he stops dead in his tracks and goes, you're eight. You're 10. Or I was 10. 10. Okay. And I remember thinking, <laughs> yeah. So I imagine you had some of those too. Yeah. In fact, uh, that definitely happened. I, a lot of times what would happen too is people would come in and, and they'd be like, is there somebody who here who can help me? And I'm like, well, yeah, I can. You know, And they're like, is there anybody else? You know, yeah, it's just me right now. Um, except, you know, yeah, it's just me right now. You know, right. Right. a couple of octaves higher. And um, and they'd turn around to leave and I'd, I'd be like, I can see you have some rear foot eversion on your Saucony shoes with a ground reaction inertia device. <laughs> sometimes that and by the way, I run a 308 marathon. Yeah. I might be able to help you, you know. And I, sometimes I imagine that would, you know, stop them in their tracks and work. And other times it's like, great, is there somebody older? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, pretty much. Okay. So he, you're, you and he are running a running shoe store. Um, we're getting closer to the next thing that would lead to what eventually became Ultra. Yep. So I managed the shop, you know, started managing near the end of high school and after high school. Um, and then as I went off to college, you know, there was, uh, we get all this training at Run Specialty, but it's not training, it's propaganda. So it, the only training anybody at Run Specialty gets is from shoe companies. Right. And so again, it's not training, it's propaganda. Okay. And I realized well, that- give me, Well, give me an example. Like what will be, you know, they come in with a new shoe and what do they tell you? I mean, what, how does that all go down? Well, I think the most classic one is like, you know, these shoes are going to save your knees. You know, this, this cushioning system is going to help your knees out. It's good. Or it's going to help your joints or it's going to, you know, whatever. And it's just, and we can get into this later. It's literally exactly the opposite of what the science would say about that technology. Right. You know, if you, if you had an actual scientist doing a study or you had studies on hand, that analyzed this, you know, that had to do with this technology, you'd see it was the exact opposite of what we were being trained. Right. And that's a problem. And that was, you know, or another one would be like, you know, at the time, the whole pronation paradigm was really big. It was like, oh, your feet roll in, you overpronate, you're going to get hurt. Um, you know, that's bad and we need to fix you. And so we're going to give you this anti-pronation device in your shoe. And it was all this kind of stuff. And the problem for me is that, after being, you know, working there almost 10 years now before I'm heading off to college, I'm realizing it's not working. Right. Like people are coming back with the same problems and the solutions that we've been trained on. I've now been doing them for 10 years and they're not working. Like people right. are coming back with the same issues over and over and over. And so I'm not stupid. You know, I'm like, well, you know, stupid is doing the same thing over and over and over. In fact, it's insanity to keep doing it over and over and, and expect different results. Right. And we weren't getting great results. And that was really frustrating. So my whole thing was like, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to study the science behind how to be a better shoe seller, essentially, how to help people. Because half the people that come into a run specialty store to buy shoes don't even run. 
they're just there because their feet are jacked up, you know, or something right. hurts. And the other half, you know, they might run, but they're usually there because something's wrong as well. And, you know, I'm a passionate person. I love helping people. And I just really wanted to be good at helping my customers out. So I, I you know, in my book, I was going to come back. I was going to manage the shop the rest of my life. And this was my life's work was to figure out how to best help people that came in the door. And then on to the next chapter. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm one of those people that took nine years through college. Uh, we usually call those doctors. But or slackers. Yeah. Or way. Mine was a four year degree that just, you know, happened to get stretched out over nine years because I studied whatever I wanted and as much of it as I wanted. I, I had enough credits for multiple degrees. Oh, what a hoop. Um, and uh, when I I ended up going to Hawaii along the way and I spent two years out there. And that was just that was kind of the switch flipper, I guess you could say. Because um, I had looked at everything through a running lens. Okay. Previous and for a couple years, I had been uh, toying around with V-Room Five Fingers. We, my shop was the first store in America to carry them, first running store. Okay, I was um, say not. No, there was a store in uh, in on Pearl Street that um, they're known for like being the first one to grab things. Mm -hmm. So they got the first pair of Crocs. They had the first pair of Five Fingers, as far as okay. I can tell. Yeah. Um. So, but yeah, I get it. Yeah, we were the first running store. In in fact, when we told we came back to the OR show, the, their very first OR show. We outdoor, came back. Outdoor retailer. Yeah, yeah, outdoor retailer. Big show for everything related to outdoor, et cetera. And we, we brought an order to them and, you know, they were like, okay, what's your shop name? We're like, oh, Runner's Corner. And they, they were like, what are you going to do with these? And we were like, what are you going to sell these for? And we were like, for running. And they were literally like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, no, that's, you know, this is at the time they just had the one slip-on classic model. Right. That was it, you know? And our thought was, we're going to sell these as a... Um, as a training tool to help people work on their running technique and strengthen their feet. Cause in our book, those were the two most important things that happened to any runner out there technique and strong feet. So that had, that had been going on and I, I go out to Hawaii and I'm, you know, my entire life, all the propaganda training I've been given by the shoe companies is flat feet are bad. Over pronation is terrible. If you're overweight, it's going to make it a hundred times worse. And it's, it's basically the end, that triple combination is the end of the world, you know, for, for people. So for people listening, see if you can predict what's next. Uh, Cause you know, if you think about Hawaii and think about native Hawaiians or Samoans, uh, so put your, uh, you, there's nowhere to actually enter your guesses, but keep it in your brain and now back to you, Golden. Well, and I think the, the part I missed on the end of there is that, and that good shoes, good shoes are are really important in all of this. Oh yeah, well, they'll fix all those. And I've had this beaten into my head my entire life. It's hard to pull that out. Even though I was doubting it, yes. I still get over there. You got tons of 300 pound giant humans walking around, just giant Polynesian people. They got flat feet. They roll in like crazy. So they're they're pronating and they're wearing no shoes. Or they, they're in slippers, you yeah. know, flip-flops. Did they have say. any problems like the people that came into your running shoe store? Well, so this is the thing. It's like I felt for a minute there when I first got there, like, you know, okay, I doubt this stuff, I, but it's hard to root it out, you know? So yeah. as I get to know these people, I'm like, okay, I'm going to wait, you know, I'll get to know them well, then I'll ask them, then I'll help them, you know? And, you know, my first one is like my boss, you know, and I get to know him really well. We work together daily and, and I was like, hey, you know, tell me about your feet because I, I can see, you know you know, you're a big guy, they roll in, you wear crap shoes. Like, this is what I do. Like, I can, I can help you and tell me about your feet. They hurt. Right. And he's like, no, bro. And I'm like, no, it's okay. Like we can, it's, it's fine. Like I'm, I'm yeah. If not your this feet, is, maybe this, your knees. Yeah. This is what I do. Right. You know? And he's, he's just like, no problem. My feet don't hurt. You know, my knees don't hurt either. Sorry, bro. Like it's just nothing, you know. I mean, ignoring and, for the sake of argument that there's nothing that Hawaiians like better than white guys just showing up and telling them what to do. Yeah, which is why I waited like <laughs> months to get to know people before even starting yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. But across the board, like almost nobody's feet hurt, knees hurt, you know, etc. Right. It was the exact opposite of everything I'd been trained my entire life. And again, I was already questioning it before I got out there, but this was seeing it in person, yeah. you know. And then I'm running the best I have in my whole life. I'm running barefoot on the beach up to 90 minutes at a time. And I'm dominating collegiate cross-country races, setting records, et cetera. And at the same time, I'm I'm wearing slippers and walking around barefoot a ton and you know, living this this lifestyle out there. 
And so that kind of thrust me into this whole like study the foot part of things. Right. And it, you know, added on to all the um, exercise science and running technique and running injury stuff that I'd been doing. And it tied in really well because it turns out that feet are a huge part of all of that, you know, and, and they go hand in hand. Unintended. And exactly. Um, <laughs> and so as I came back from Hawaii, I uh, came back to the running store and my first thought was like, oh my goodness, I don't really believe in anything we're selling anymore, you know? And that was a really tough place to be because this is where you're making your living, right? Right. And my dad has, um, he blew his knee out playing college football and has no cartilage in his knee. And the only way he was able to run, he actually got dared into becoming a distance runner. Um, he, he got a postcard in the mail from his roommate's dad that was like, if, if you guys are, are really tough, if you guys are real men, you'll do this. That's all it took and was a postcard? Pretty much. Wow. And, well, I you, you got to understand the psyche though. You know, these, oh, no, I get him. The guy that jumps off 90 foot cliffs for fun, you okay. know, just to prove how macho he is. Um, and so when somebody sends a postcard that says, if you guys are really tough, if you're a real man, you'll do this. I'm going to send, you know? send him a postcard. If you were a real man, you know, you would give us a whole bunch of money right now because we're <laughs> trying to grow the company. I mean, if you were a real man, um, but you know, I, I want to highlight something you said, because people ask often why we, and I'm going to include both ultra and zero in this mm -hmm. equation, you know, why we're not in more stores. And I said, because fundamentally people realize in the stores that they have to learn something new and that if they learn what we're saying is true, they won't be able to sell anything that they have on the shelf. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a tough road to hoe when you're threatening someone's livelihood. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult, you know, and I, I think Alter is in 1200 plus stores nationwide, you and know, are, almost all running stores though. And yeah. And know. I mean, the number of like stores for which you or I would be appropriate is somewhere in the order of like 50,000. Yeah, there could be a lot. Yeah. But yeah, no, your, your point is is true. It's it's very difficult at the least to manage this idea of looking through things through a different lens, a different lens, a natural lens yeah. and still be able to make a living or still be able to sell that other stuff. It's the selling the other stuff that's the challenge. I mean, there are a couple of uh, stores that that focus on minimalist natural movement, and they have cracked code. They figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. It is totally doable. Yep. But the idea that you're going to take a store and have them switch over to that is the odds are pretty much close to zero. Well, it takes years. Yeah, it's and, and it's it's harder. Yeah, that's the thing. Is doing things the right way is harder. I and it's harder to make money. It's harder to learn it. Once you've figured it yeah, out, yeah, yeah. it's more fun. It's easier in a lot of ways. It's certainly better. It's more rewarding. Right. Um, but the training is more difficult. The, um, yeah. You well, know, because you, um, you're, again, you're taking people that have been programmed a certain way their entire correct. life and having to flip them. Correct. I mean, I, I'm doing this with my staff, you know, right now. Well, it's an so, easy story to say uh, some version of cushioning, art support, motion control. Yeah. You just need to say those three words. People are like, I'm in because that's what they've been taught. Yeah. So yeah, it is a different game. So anyway, you came back, you're looking at the wall going, how am I going to do this? And then. Yeah. So back to my dad, he he's, he's got no cartilage in the knee. It's dared into running Las Vegas marathon. Horrible. Just <laughs> crawls across the finish line. One of the last finishers of the race. Yeah. And this is a guy who's like, was drafted to play pro baseball. Who's never really been bad at much of anything, um, but no endurance genes. No athletic genes in his family. Um, and it's it's actually the same on my mom's side. And Except she didn't get drafted to play pro baseball. True. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so he eventually, after failing at the marathon six times, like laying in gutters, begging for Coke and, and food, you know, just disastrous results, cracks the code because he, he figures out if I run like those guys, the Kenyans, they float. Now, this is a guy that's 5'9", 240 pounds of solid, you know, muscle pound. Right. And so it's a, it's a little bit funny to think about. But, you know, he he thinks to himself, if I ran like that, you know, I crashed down the road. Everybody around me, we most everybody, we crashed down the road. Right. Those guys, it looks like they barely touch the ground. I mean, they just float. And um, this is the inspiration for what I call float running now. Mm. And so, um, and he uh, he basically teaches himself to run like a Kenyan. And for purpose of the story, we'll shorten it. We'll skip ahead seven years. So seven years later. Sorry, wait. Yep. Okay. 
he runs 222, wins the St. George Marathon in 1984. Holy uh, I would be two years old at the time. And um, he becomes, you know, ranked in the top 15 in the country uh, as a runner and, um, you know, becomes an elite runner sponsored athlete and, uh, you know, getting paid, paid to run essentially. And so that is kind of his thing is he, he attributes almost all of his success outside of just hard work and stuff to, to great running technique, right. low impact, efficient running technique. And so this brings us back to where you were. Okay. It's back to the store. <laughs> and so we're trying, everybody that comes in the door, our store is unique in that we didn't really do this. We did the whole pronation thing for about a year and we, we kept, um, we kept stats on it. And we knew that when we did pronation testing on the treadmill and assigned shoes that we saw twice as many injuries, our return rate was twice as high. And we, in general, just the customer experience was not as good. Right. So it was after that, my dad was like, get rid of the treadmill. We're not going to do the pronation analysis thing like that. You know, we're, we're going to look at, we're going to go back to focusing on people's running form and boom, injury rates went back down. Return rates on shoes went back down. Customer experience was better across the board. And so um, we had been there, done that. Right. And so focusing on teaching people how to move in efficient, low impact ways, uh, as part of the shoe selling process, which as far as I know, there's like almost no running stores across the country that do this. And when you think about it, it's it's straight up crazy because in any other sport, the first thing we do in every other sport is teach people how, how to do it. Yeah. We teach them how to do it. We I'm teach just... them how to do it safely, efficiently, better, you know, more effectively, et cetera. This is the only sport where we tell people just, oh, just, go. No, just go ahead. Well, because it, it, this is kind of like writing, you know, you go through school and you're writing papers. So everyone thinks they're a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing. You know, we grew up, you know, we walk, we run. Oh, I know how to walk and run. It's like, no, uh, you probably, I mean, even if you did, and of course we all know that you watch little kids before they get in shoes and they know how to do both of those things beautifully. Right. But we don't think about how the footwear then impacts that and changes your gait and you become habituated to that. But everyone still thinks, oh, I know how to run because I've been running. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I run to the mailbox, I run to the car, I run to whatever. But but the thing that people don't think about is that running is also the only sport where we put a the mandatory mandatory piece of equipment on your foot that actually teaches you to do it wrong. Correct. And this is what I was about to discover is that the shoes that I'd been selling and wearing my whole life had actually been making it difficult for me to do just this. And dude, you're doing this in chapters. This is like crazy. It's like, okay, we're on to chapter three. Yeah. Golden's discovery. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, go back to, to 84 and, and my dad winning St. George, he found that, um, for his knee again, cartilage, none bone on bone, no meniscus, and, you know, 222 marathon, no meniscus, visibly limping. Um, but he found he could run with better efficient low impact technique when he drilled holes in the back half of the shoe. So he was essentially lowering the heel height and getting the shoe more weight balanced. Wait, so wait, so he's drilling the holes like going through the midsole. Through the midsole. Yep. Got through, it. Sideways. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it. So he's drilling all the weight and he's, height out of the midsole. I hate to say it this way, but I will. So he was doing the uh, early version of what On is doing, except on, the way On is doing it is not real. But, yeah. 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 Except but, he would just do the back half of the shoe because back then there was basically no cushioning in the front half of shoes. Right. You know, it was, it was thin and it was firm. Um, so in, in a way he was leveling the shoe out and weight balancing it, which is really what I ended up doing. So really, really interesting. Uh, and so he was really passionate when people came in, let's teach them technique. No, you I was going to say, give me your shoes. I'm going to yeah, yeah, holes in them. Yeah. We didn't, yeah, that, that came go, later. Yeah. I was gonna, uh, that would go over really well at first. But yeah, we did do that um, in, a, in a way, but either way you come in the store and my dad wanted to, wanted to share like, Hey, this is, this is what helped me. I think it can help you. And it was part of our, you know, store ethos, if you will, to teach people how to run, actually, right? How to how to run with low impact, efficient technique. And so we're doing this, and um, at the same time, you know, I'm just back from Hawaii. High speed video, you know, lets you see things in slow motion clearly. Becomes available to like not rich people, right? You know, and so we get this handheld, you know, slow motion video camera, and we start filming our customers. 
And of course, you know, we're filming them with the shoes on that we're selling them. We're filming them in racing flats. We're filming them in five fingers and we're filming them barefoot, you know, some combination. And it becomes really obvious really quick to the point where like people run pretty great without shoes on, you know, they run pretty decent in five fingers, um, change. some change, but not like tons. Um, and then we're filming them with the shoes on and we're kind of starting to do this thing where we're like, <laughs> Oh and, no. And the comment was, I don't know if we're really helping people here. You know, that, that was this moment of wow. like, Oh no, you know, like, and it was, it was this idea that the shoes we're selling people are physically changing the way they move. Right. And now like the way I, the way I actually talk about this with people is modern shoes have fundamentally changed how we move as a species like, at least in the west anyone wearing them yes yeah anyone wearing modern shoes it's it's changed the way we as a species move so for example you can go watch any movie pre-1960 people walk a certain way that they don't anymore yeah people run a certain way that they don't anymore in general the only people that walk and move like the people pre-1960s are the people that don't wear shoes or don't wear elevated heels. And, you know, if you're listening, you may not understand this. Like most people I talk to think their shoes are flat. Right. And they, they think their shoes have a wide toe box. And, and the reality is 99% of all shoes on the market have an elevated heel. And the midsole is almost always twice as thick in the heel as it is in the forefoot. Right. And um, the toe box is tapered, meaning that the big toe gets bent in and the pinky toe gets bent in. Um, you're fundamentally dislocating your first metatarsal. Um, anytime yeah. you put a shoe on, 99% of all shoes. And so people are literally moving differently. And, and we're just going back, you know. Yeah, we're going 65 back. 65 years right now is all. That's it. That's it. I um, Do you know the writer David Sedaris? I don't know if I do. It's okay. Um, he spent a lot of time living in France. Oh. And he said, my French friends tease me that I walk like an American. And finally I said, what does that mean? They said, you throw your legs in front of you. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a higher heel and you basically have to lean back to accommodate, the only thing you can do is throw, throw your legs your legs in front of you. you. Yeah. yeah. And there they wear a lot of flatter shoes. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, 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 My line is, if you want to see people who have really good uh, walking form in particular, go to anywhere where they also don't have indoor plumbing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> so okay, so you had you had the uh, the holy crap moment of we're not necessarily helping people. We're seeing that shoes are making this difference, and then are we are we still in chapter three? Or are we on to chapter four? I think we're moving there. Okay, so um, it was at this point I was like, why? Okay, now we're there. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that was that was the cliffhanger for chapter four. Right. So what about uh, <laughs> what about these shoes that we're selling? is causing people to move differently and yeah. run poorly. You know, what is causing them to basically land out in front of their body on a forward traveling leg instead of landing underneath a bent knee on a backward traveling leg. And it's the difference between jamming all that impact up into your joints, or if you're doing it right, you're landing underneath this bent knee and you're using this big three foot spring to absorb impact. And again, why? And so, I started just filming and we started looking at, you know, how shoes were built. Drop was not a term back then. I invented it. Okay. Um, and um, I got looking at the shoes and none of this was published at right. the time. And, and this, so this is what year? This is 2008, early 2008. Got okay? it. Oh, I wow. Think. Yep. The so, interesting timing is where Yeah, find exactly. Um, and so I start looking at the shoes and I start weighing them and I find out, the shoes are all heel heavy. Like if you balance a shoe, you know, in half, it's, it's yeah. the back half of the shoe just always cranks off the back. You know, it's much heavier in the back half of the shoe and, and all the cool stuff's in the heel of the shoe. Yeah. You know, we had, <laughs> we had grid, we had gel, we had air, we springs. had you know, springs, yeah. had all the stuff. It's all in the heel of the shoe basically. And then also shoes have these like plastic heavy heel counters in the back. There's their structure to keep your foot from, moving and doing things that it's quote unquote not supposed to do well um, structure no design to do that that right. doesn't mean they do that no they don't do that right. it just looks like they do that right so and that's a that's a great important distinction that that we know and didn't know at the time but um so 
so my first thought is, you know, we watch the foot come out in front of the body and let's see if I can demonstrate this on the camera here. But as the foot comes out in front of the body and you have to describe it for people, generally speaking, when you stay barefoot, the foot kind of moves like this, right? And the foot lands relatively parallel with the ground. Yeah. But when you're, when I was filming people in the shoes, I was selling them. What we'd see is that the foot comes out in front of the knee, the heel drops and the toes pop up more in the air. And then as the foot comes down, because it's thicker in the back half of the shoe, it would catch the ground two to three inches further out in front of the body before the foot could get underneath the knee. Right. And so that, that was the distinction I was seeing is like, okay, so the weight of the shoe being heavier in the back half is actually causing a little bit more dorsiflexion perhaps. I mean, I, I want, I mean, I wonder if it's the weight or just simply, you know, this is going to be a weird story. Mm. Um, so we're moving forward in time, a couple of years, not that many. And uh, I give Dan Lieberman from Harvard, who we will mention in a few moments, I'm sure, I give him a pair of our sandals. Mm -hmm. And a little while later, I asked him what he thought. He said, I'm getting proprioceptive information that these things are dangerous. And I said, without missing a beat, no, you're not. And he and the people around him were sort of aghast that I had just criticized, you know, the preeminent researcher and whatever. And by the way, Dan and I are dear friends, but that moment was a little tense. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's, well, I'm getting the, the information that I'm going to catch the front edge of the sandal and then I'm going to fall. I said, well, there's nowhere in the running gate where it would be even remotely possible for you to catch the front edge right. of the sandal. And even if you did, it would just flip over and flip back. Yep. So you have a picture in your mind of something that is telling you, basically giving you an idea that's patently false. But the reason that I bring that up with regard to shoes is there's things that we do in our brain because of what we, I said, what's actually happening is you're getting no proprioceptive information and you're turning that into this story that you haven't really proven true or not true. But so I would contend that even if the shoe was lightweight, like if you made the heel super lightweight, but still that high, there'd still be something. You're, I mean, at the very least, if you're running with that barefoot form, you would just catch the, the back edge, regardless of, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're trying to land with your foot flat, you'd still catch the back edge. But I also imagine that because you saw the same thing, different shoes on different people, different gait. Yep. I saw that in the lab with Dr. Bill Sands, different shoes, different people, different gait, and they yep. don't know they're doing it differently. Right. So I would... And studies have repeatedly shown that people don't land the way they think they land. Correct. So, so I, you know, I don't know if it's true or not. This is just kind of academic, but I would imagine that just having the shoes on people's feet tells their brain something that's making them accommodate in some way, just in case, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever other reason. But anyway, could be the yep. way it could be, you know, this other thing. Regardless, same end result. Yeah. So, you know, both the shoe being heavier in the back and thicker in the back. Right. So regardless, you're landing, you're hitting, they are hitting two to three inches more out in front of their At body. At least. On a forward traveling leg, instead of hitting underneath the knee, under a backward traveling leg. And right. this is critical stuff for anybody who studies running technique. Or physics. Know, or, yes. <laughs> or physics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and... So for me, it was like, okay, so this is what's going on. The shoe's heavier in the back half, it's thicker in the back half. Um, and and we saw it, you know, we tried to kind of control out soft even. We would we would put like um, steel insoles in. So the shoe is just rock hard, basically. Right. And even with a rock hard shoe, we, we would see the same thing. And so I don't. I personally don't believe it's because it was softer or it felt like it was going to be nicer to land on. I, I hear a lot of that in the, in the barefoot crowd is like, Oh, it's, it's an accommodating landing. You know, I do think that is part of the equation, Yeah. but when the shoe is thicker in the back half and heavier in the back half, it doesn't seem to matter whether it is um, soft or hard, soft or hard. Right. People still end up catching early because it's just physics. Right. You know, it's heavier, so that's going to change the amount your dorsiflex midair, right. and it's thicker, so that's going to change the actual contact point with the ground. And so, um, obviously, you make it softer and more accommodating. Then there's the mental of I can do it even more. You right. know, so because well, because to to that point, the confusion there I would contend is that if you do make something softer and you're not feeling it as much in the foot, or more accurately the foam is basically uh, dissipating the pressure, mm -hmm. but the force still has to go somewhere. And if you're not feeling it in the foot, which has just more sensory uh, um, receptors than anywhere else, then it's just traveling up into places, into upstream joints, in particular the knee and the hip. Yep. that don't have sure. that sensory information available to them. Right. So it takes longer before you yeah. like- Yeah, by the time you realize it, it's too late. It's too late. Yeah. yeah. And as I would say, force doesn't magically disappear. 
It yeah. has to go somewhere. Yes. So if it's not getting absorbed down low and controlled down low, and again, this is why foot strength is so important. Um, if your foot can't dissipate impact at the point of impact, yeah, then the force doesn't magically disappear. It translates up the kinetic chain. It hits your weak link. Yep. You know, um, and this we'll come back to this because this is a whole cushioning discussion that we need to have. We'll, but, we'll get there. Uh, so just an FYI, we're getting so close to starting a shoe company. We're yes. one chapter away. We are. So, <laughs> so it's at this point, you know, my brain says, I'm training for a rocky 50 mile race in the mountains. And I'm an elite athlete. Like I'm, there's a good chance I'm going to win this race against paid professionals. Um, so I need, I need a shoe that I can run as fast as possible. Um, but I, and I need something that simulates me essentially being barefoot on natural ground. And, um, and I'm looking at my customers who for the most part run on concrete and sidewalk. And we've been selling Vibram five fingers for a couple of years at our shop at this point in time. And we're having great success with anybody who uses them as a training tool a couple times a week, strengthen your feet, run short to moderate distances in them, work on your running technique, etc. But no matter how hard we try, very few of these people are able to, you know, keep running 30, 40, 50 miles a week while yeah. in the five fingers. Well, if for no other reason than all the mocking. <laughs> sure, because they just look stupid. Um, yeah. So social pressure <laughs> aside. Um, but yeah, it's 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 difficult. And so my thought was like, hey, I want to make something that simulates running on running barefoot on grass or running right. barefoot on dirt, you know, a natural surface. And also I'm running, you know, I'm running this rocky 50 mile race. I want something that is going to be more protective, you right. know. And in my in my mind, there was already kind of a solution for when you wanted to mimic, you know, barefoot purely is you could just go barefoot or, or put the five fingers on or, or something along those lines. And I find, you know, we get looking at the Tarumara sandals and they're an inch thick. Yeah. The the um, the Waraches that they wear. So this so I think like, OK, I'm going to take these shoes that I've got our best selling shoes at the store and. I'm going to get the elevated heel and the weight out of the back half of the shoe. We're going to expand the front half of the shoe as much as possible. So, so we're already most customers were selling in their shoes, a size, size and a half, even two, two and a half sizes. Just to get the right width. Um, and even that doesn't even really work. So we end up skipping yeah. the laces in the front half of the shoe. So they can't physically tie the shoe um, in the front half. So the toes can spread out as much as possible. And back to our, our previous discussion about what was happening with the foot. So, I go to my, you know, I tell my dad, I'm like, I, as we look on the film, you know, the shoes are heavier in the back half. They're thicker in the back half. What if we leveled it out, you know, and we kept, you know, we kept the cushioning consistent front to back. And he's like, that might do it. I, you know, my old shoes that I used to race in, I would always drill the holes out of the back half to make the back half of the shoe lighter yep. and make it lower in, in essence. And, uh, so I was like, well, I think what I can do is, you know, put a pair of shoes and, you know, heat them up, take out the midsole, glue in a level flat piece of, of foam and glue the rubber back on. And he's, you know, my dad is always like modifying shoes. Like I remember him doing like this glow in the dark paint and he'd put on shoes. <laughs> and if you run under street, he'd go run under street lights to charge it. Right. You know, and then you keep going and it's, you get the idea. So modifying shoes was totally normal at my house. And so oh, this explains something about your dad's craziness. Uh, was the house ventilated properly? Uh, no, no, probably not. But in the, in this instance, my dad's eyes kind of light up and he's like 275. Wait till the glue bubbles. You know? And but downstairs in the, the mini oven, the toaster oven downstairs. Oh, my God. Her mom won't see because she gets mad when it smells bad. And, you know, you're, you're using a kitchen appliance to bake shoes, you know. And so. <laughs> You're you're practically Walter White from Breaking Bad when it comes to footwear. It, this is this is the, this is the what this is the footwear version of a meth lab. Pretty much, yeah, exactly. And it it smells. I don't know what a meth lab smells like, but it definitely uh, yeah. smells like burning rubber. It smells like this um, is not good for you. Yeah. yeah. So I took the at the time the um, the shoe with the least structure in the heel I could find that okay. was the most weight balanced. It didn't have all the heavy heel counters and stuff. Simple midsole. And, um, I, I took it down 275 degrees, stuck it in there 
and waited for the glue to bubble and, <laughs> and frankly waited too long, melted the laces, melted the TPU on the upper. I mean, it was ugly, you know, pull this shoe out of there and it smells horrible. Grab a pair of pliers, rip the rubber outsole off, rip the midsole out. And I cut out some Spenco foam mm -hmm. and Spenco has this original, they call it their comfort foam. It's pretty firm, really bouncy. Um, and it comes in these sheets right? and it's, it's level, it's flat. And so I glued in a couple layers of this Spenco foam and then, and I glued the rubber back on and I instantly went for a run. And for the first time in my life, I'm running down the sidewalk or the road. And I feel like more or less, and again, these shoes are two sizes too big with no laces in the front half. I mean, they're Frankenstein to the nth degree, right? And, but I feel like I have this sensation of I'm running barefoot on grass. And I just have this moment of like, thank you. <laughs> like this, yeah. I'm all the running technique stuff I've been taught since I was eight years old. You know, I had sessions with Dr. Tom Miller, author of program to run at age eight. I've been taught great running technique my whole life. And I've always felt like my shoes or my feet bought my mm -hmm. running technique. And for yeah. the first time I'm like, it's just happening. And I feel like I'm running that freedom, you know, and if you've ever run barefoot on the grass, you understand this freedom I'm talking about. And I just had this feeling and I was like, oh my gosh, this is great, you know? And so for me, it worked. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, I've got to, I've got to prove it now. Well, go ahead to proving it. Then, but actually, well, I'll, I'll do this. The irony here in a way, or I don't know if it's an irony, but the thing that's kind of entertaining me now that I think of it is if you were older, you might've had a different solution to try. Because if you were my age, I'm what, 500 years older than you, something like that. Um, you might've remembered the original waffle trainer. Mm -hmm. which was basically flat with about 10 mil of rubber that, or 10 mil of foam. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you would have like hunted, got like on, Hey, wait a minute. I remember using those. And then you would have hunted those down. Well, but it's interesting he, you say that because how I ended up proving it is along these lines. All right. Then hit me. So <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm one guy. Let's test it on our staff at, at the shop. Right. So, and we've got about two dozen employees at the time. We had just tons so of wait, So I was wrong. So this is another chapter before we get to the starting a shoe company. Chapter. Yeah, maybe. Okay. And I'm like, how do I, I can't make two dozen pairs of shoes in the toaster oven? You know, we've done a, a couple. It's just, it's not efficient, you know? <laughs> and I see these 1984 Saucony Jazz Originals oh, that they've re-released. What a riot. And they're actually similar to the to the waffles you're yeah, yeah. talking about. but. Um, all the shoes back then had these two layer midsoles. Right. And I wish I had one here. I probably have a picture somewhere here. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but essentially there's, there's one layer of midsole that's flat mm -hmm. uh, that runs the length of the shoe. And then there's a second layer of midsole that's the exact same thickness that starts in the heel and then dives down through the arch and disappears by the time it gets under the forefoot. Right. And so you can visually see the shoe is exactly twice as thick in the heel as it is in the forefoot which is essentially how all running shoes have been built ever, ever since. since or worse. Um, yeah. Or worse. Um, and so I went to the shoemaker, the cobbler shop that was just a mile down the street from our running store. And the guy that ran the cobbler shop mm -hmm. actually ran rivers with my dad in the grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And so I went to, this is Robert Glazier. He's a certified Pedorthus second generation, maybe third generation shoemaker. And I, I go to him and I'm like, Hey, Robert, can we, uh, can we, you see the way this shoe is built? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, see that top layer of foam there? Can we take that out? And he looks at me and he's like, well, first off, I usually add things to shoes, <laughs> not take things out. Why would you want to do that? And I explained to him, well, you know, with that second layer of foam there, it, it actually changes your ankle position, your knee position, your hip position, your back position. It actually physically changes your posture. So for standing, it has all these negative effects that your body has to, to make up for. Um, and then it changes the way you walk. It makes you land out in front of your body on more of a straight leg. It causes more impact. It's it's harder on your shins, your knees, hips, back. Um, and it changes the way people run. And I'm trying to make running shoes that don't jack with people. Right. I want to make something that is as, as natural as it can be and still be a running shoe with some cushioning. And he looks at me and he looks at these shoes and he just starts shaking his head. And he's like, well... Sure makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and, That's brilliant. And it's the exact opposite of everything. He's, you know, he's right. always adding things to shoes, but. Well, you know what? what? I'll tell you what's funny. You just did with him and he was amenable to it. The thing that. And props to him for that. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. 
because most people, you know, when they hear something that contradicts what they believe, they latch onto what they believe even more firmly. Right. But you're doing the thing that we've had to figure out to do in advertising what we're doing, which is get people to think about something unrelated to footwear in, to a certain extent that just makes sense. Yeah. Like, is weaker better than stronger? No. When you put your arm in a cast, does it come out stronger? No. no. When you put your foot in something that similarly restricts its movement, what happens? Atrophy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, you got to get people to that point of like having that aha moment unrelated in a way mm -hmm. and then translate it. So you did that with him and he was, again, smart enough to respond appropriately. Because when I do this with people, most people respond appropriately. Um, the other half just respond with, hey, moron. Yeah. Like, uh, which part of weaker, better than stronger was confusing? Or yeah. not being, <laughs> weaker, not being better than stronger was confusing. Yeah. So. Yeah. So long story short, he made this, you know, this first two dozen pairs of shoes for yeah. me. We tested out on our staff and 19 out of 20 loved it. And the 20th and was the one who also did not prefer Trident gum. Maybe. To, yeah. And the, the irony is he ended up being an ultra wearer like ah, 10 years later. Right. Um, and so um, anyway, so 19 out of 20, I was like, well, that's pretty good. That's like 95%, you know? Um, and we're talking about hacked up 1984 rerun shoes that we're getting this kind of success with. Yeah. And, you know, again, like to kind of fast forward a little bit, it just got to the point where we're wearing them, testing them in the store and I'm, I'm wearing my pair and I just, I just like the way they feel. I, no other reason, not a ton of science at this point in time. I just, I just feel better standing in them, walking right. around the store. I like running in them. And I've got this, I have this guy that comes in, he's had knee pain for 10 years plus he's, we've tried everything, you know? we're trying everything. And he's like, well, what are you wearing? And I was like, Frankenstein shoes, basically. <laughs> and he's like, well, why? I'm like, well, they, on video, it looks like they help you run more naturally, you know, land underneath a, a bent knee. And, and he's like, well, my knees are the problem. Don't you think that might help me? And I was like, yeah, but they're Frankenstein shoes. Like I would get sued if I sold you these. And he's like, well, at least let me try them. And he happened to be my same size. So he puts them on, goes for a run, and he's gone a long time. And if you if you ever worked at a running store and somebody's gone a long time, it's you not good. you have the thought of, dude, jacked my shoes. Yeah, you know, uh, which happens very rarely, and it's not smart because usually the people working there are pretty fast. But um, <laughs> thanks for running you down. But wait, but, hold on, wait, I got to do this. Uh, this had not had nothing to do with being in a running shoe store and having that happen. But when I had a software company on the second floor of this building, we saw some guys, you know, through the window. Uh, rip off some lady and take off. Well, it just so happened that one of our employees is a nationally ranked marathoner. He goes, be right back. Yeah. And so he caught up to them and he's like loping. I mean, it's like as slow as he can go. And he goes, you know, I can do this for another two and a half hours without blinking. And yeah. they just stop and hand him the woman's purse. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Here's your shoes back. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Anyway, he eventually does come back and he, he comes up to me and he's like, I'll take them. And I was like, you will certainly not take them. They are mine, you know? And he's like, well, can you make me a pair like this? I'm like, well, like, just please don't tell anybody. Okay? It's like, <laughs> we don't want to get sued. Like, yeah. I promise the shoe company that made this shoe is not happy about us cutting, you know, the back half of the shoe out and leveling it out and literally Frankensteining the shoe, um, you know, so just don't tell anybody. He's like, Look, well, that's fine. If it makes my knee better, I'm, I'm good with anything, you know? And it's not a month later, some guy comes in and is like, hey, who sold Joe the hacked up shoes? You know, and I'm sitting there on the fit bench like, come on, man. Like, I told you. told you not to tell anybody. Do you know what happens? You tell people not to tell people things. Yeah. They freaking tell everybody. Like, Don't give people a mandate. They'll do the opposite. Yeah. So again, let's fast forward. We're like a little over a year later. We've now sold a thousand pair-ish, about a thousand pair of modified zero drop expanded toe box too big shoes because it it went like wildfire and real quick we're like okay the only way around this the only way to save ourselves is we make a research study out of it so everybody who gets a hacked up modified pair of shoes we we send them home with this survey we pay them 10 bucks to bring it back in six weeks of, of store credit or gift card or whatever and um and we get all this data and then we track it and and we tell them you know, by buying these shoes, you are opting into this study essentially. Right. And, and we need this data back and, you know, you, you're willingly buying a shoe that, you know, has been changed and, 
And that was kind of our way around getting sued. It probably still yeah. wouldn't have worked. Luckily, we're past the statute of limitations. Well, now, it, so it, yes, okay, in, but... in a different era, aka now, mm -hmm. that would have not flown. But yeah. uh, those were those were more pleasant times, more pastoral, and <laughs> you know, people left pies on the windowsill and they yeah. stayed there. Oh, it was dreamy. Yeah. Oh wait, I'm thinking of uh, the Andy Griffith show. That's yeah. different. <laughs> So um, anyway, that's the, we basically had this data though, that was great. Yeah. And I was able to take it. We had great contacts within the shoe industry. Obviously my dad was well-connected. We, you know, we were the biggest running store in Utah. Um, and so it was, it was easy for us to, you know, go to our friends and be like, Hey, we've been getting people's big toe to straighten out and their toes to be able to spread out. And we get the, the forefoot and the heel level with the ground and all these good things happen specifically like five areas that were really strong with the data, plantar fascia issues, shin splints, runner's knee, it band and low back. Um, some of which made sense to us, the shin splints, the runner's knee, the it band, no brainer. We're yeah. like, yeah, you land underneath, you know, a bent knee, of course, like three foot spring absorbs impact. Those areas are going to take less, less of a beat down the plantar fascia one, the low back one, we didn't really see coming quite as much. Um, and those were like huge ones. Oh yeah. And just massive success with, I mean, to the point that people are taking in every pair of shoes in their closet, their dress shoes, everything they own and having them Land out. zeroed out yeah. at the time. And this is where we actually came up with the term zero drop. So uh, when we were modifying, we, we quickly, pivoted to modifying our best-selling shoes in the store and this the thousand pair was mostly our best-selling shoes in the store hacked up and modified and so um robert would sit there and measure them with these um millimeter rulers and i would talk about how the heel dropped down to the forefoot the cushioning of the shoe dropped from the heel down to the forefoot and he'd sit there and measure and he'd be like ah oh, it's you know still dropping you know a couple millimeters and i'm like okay great you know sand a couple more out and he'd get the sander out and you know sand a couple more millimeters out and then we'd, we'd sit there and measure it again he's like okay it's you know it's dropping zero millimeters and i was like robert you're Zip. genius we don't have to call them hacked up modified frankenstein shoes anymore we will call them zero drop shoes um and this is you know ironically the term described the cushioning in the shoe <laughs> and so yeah it was really funny when ultras came out right after the first ultras came out which were zero drop foot shaped cushioned running shoes um the very first like uh merrells came out uh, the merrell barefoots and a, a couple of other shoes that were non-cushioned right and we had actually put this zero drop term all over the internet and these non-cushioned shoes were actually using the term zero drop. Right. And we were actually denied our trademark for zero drop by the trademark commission. They referenced our own Wikipedia post and they said, oh, this is a, right. this, this term is common. It's in use publicly. And they sent back our own Wikipedia post as proof of it. And we were like, that's, we did that though. <laughs> uh, well, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to suggest that any of the companies you just mentioned in the early days had a habit of taking ideas from other companies. Oh no, never. Um, I mean, I was never involved in a potential five to $700 million lawsuit with one of those companies for <laughs> taking something that I had coined. Uh, I mean, I would never suggest that, you know, even like the name of our company was somehow absconded by one of those companies mm -hmm. in a multi-million dollar marketing campaign or that they uh, whined that it cost them $7 million to stop using that trademark, to which I would have said, had this actually happened, uh, you know, you could have owned the trademark and my whole company for five. So shut up. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's all fiction. I'm just saying right now. Right. Yeah. Just be clear. Yeah. I know how it works. That would never, <laughs> never. No. no, 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 no. Um, yes. No, the shoe industry is not all outstanding at all. wonderful human beings who do not copy ideas from other people right. in any way especially big companies copying things from smaller companies yes. so uh so you came up with zero drop you've been making made all these shoes yep um are, are we into the chapter of um let's make the crazy move of starting a footwear brand yeah so then what along this way i lost the count of what chapter we're in, by the five way. i think okay. um, so along the way <laughs> I, so for now probably nine months I've been thinking like, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking like, we've had the same seven running shoe companies since the beginning of essentially running shoe time, as far as I was concerned in my life. Um, I've been working in a shoe store at, since I was nine, you know, I'm in my upper twenties at this point in time. 
And, you know, for the last 20 years, we've basically had the same seven running shoe companies, always. Anybody who started out a new running shoe company failed. And essentially starting a shoe company is not cheap. And so you, back to where we started, you become homeless. Um, <laughs> And so this is the kind of juxtaposition. Oh, wait, I well, uh, I'm going to slow the frame down, slow the film down a little mm -hmm. bit. So literally, it's like, at what point did it actually literally occur to you? The only way this is going to happen is if we do it. It was a really, there wasn't a moment. It was okay. like a year of moments. I imagine you, you, I imagine like, you approached other like existing brands and yes. gave them this. and they. So we, we actually sent the data. We gave them the right. data and said, look, you know, you get the shoes level and get the toes to spread out. All yeah. these injuries get better and one by one to hear them, you know, some of them were just mocking, right? were, you know, laughed in our faces, you know, just cast it off. Others literally said, you know, you're probably right. And where you are now will be in 20 years. But we have existing customers and shareholders that buy our existing product that we can't alienate by doing that. Or, you know, another company said, you know, if we were to do this, we would have to put marketing behind it. And all that marketing would contradict everything we've done the last. Yeah. X eight, number of years. The, our the, whole brand history. The you know? irony, the irony about, for lack of a better term, barefoot shoes is exactly what you brought up is that if you're going to make a shoe that is truly barefooty mm -hmm. and, and there's variations in there, let's say for the sake of argument, but fundamentally they're all going to be the same. Yeah. I mean, the minor differences of like, are you going to make something clownishly wide, for example? Mm -hmm. um, uh, like the big shoe companies, we know things like Nike's Fit and Arrow, New Balance, you know, I mean, everyone has the, their little thing they've carved out because that's the only way they can differentiate. Right. And as you get more and more close to barefoot, there's fewer ways to differentiate. Yeah, and we joke at the at the running store level that with all the major running shoe brands, for the most part, we could just swap logos look. and they're all the same. Yeah. Like engineering wise, same. geometrically, they're all basically the same shoe. Yeah. They might use slightly different foam, slightly different fits, but from a geometric standpoint, engineering standpoint, well, and from swap a, logos and it doesn't matter. No, and the just research shows the same. I mean, yeah. people don't care, but... Uh, there was research where they tested on running shoes against, you know, some other similarly constructed shoe. It's like, oh, this whole, you know, little on cloud thing does not do anything different than just a bunch of foam. Right. Which, of course, shouldn't have been a surprise since Reebok tried it 12 years earlier to right. no effect. Yeah. I mean, all these tech technologies, yeah. the body kind of tunes them out in a way. Yeah. So, okay. So you have this year long thing where it's just kind of building. But yep. at a certain rejection point, after rejection. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And at a certain point though, you've got to say, all right, um, let's go find a factory. Let's, I mean, let's yeah, so raise the cash, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what happened is my cousin, Jeremy came over to my house on my birthday and he hadn't run in four or five years because of the injury. And I told him about what I was doing and he's like, well, let's just see if it works for me. And I was like, okay, we'll, we'll run, uh, we'll run three, four miles. You can run, I only have one pair of these right now, but you can wear my hacked up Frankenstein shoes out and then you wear something else, you know, we'll switch. We're same, same shoe size, luckily. And so we run on the Bonneville, Bonneville Shoreline Trail out to Dry Canyon and he is like blown away. You know, he's like, oh my gosh, I physically know I'm running differently and right. my knees don't hurt. And then, you know, we get there to the turnaround point and we switch shoes and he puts on <laughs> my normal shoes and I put on the zero drop shoes. And he's hobbling by the time he gets back. Yeah. And he's like, can I, can I get a pair? And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll make you one, you know? And he's like, no, like, like a real pair. And I was like, what do you mean a real pair? He's like, well, you know, not made by you. And I was like, why do you think I'm like making these? They don't exist. And he's like, yeah, right. You mean to tell me <laughs> there are no shoes on the planet, running shoes on the planet that are flat from heel to forefoot and that don't you know, have a tapered toe box that let, let my toes spread out. You know, basically there's no, there's not a single pair of running shoes on the planet that leaves my foot in barefoot position. And I was like, dude, that's literally why I'm making them. Like, and Wait, I'm going to pause. Do you, do you, I uh, just occurred to me. Do you know that you were wrong? You, um, you, know, you know who was doing it? Who? Lydiard. Yeah, kind of. But even then we had tapered toe box, you know, a, a little but, bit. 
but that was so far exactly. before it wasn't happening well, anymore. No, no, you no. Know, that and, was my point. Exactly. I mean, it's not happening now, but I mean, yeah. it is. My dad was a huge Olivier disciple. So, well, yeah. who, sh who, who wouldn't be? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, greatest running coach in history, really. Yeah. The, um, but to, to highlight that, I mean, it is so funny that there were these opportunities. Yeah. But when footwear brands feel threatened, they're, it's like, oh, well, yeah, we can't do that. It's yeah. going to get squashed. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I, I heard this story from someone who was a Lydiard uh, runner that when Nike started making wedged heel cushion shoes, uh, Lydiard said to Bill Bowerman, these are going to kill people. And Bowerman's response was effectively, we're selling a shitload of them. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, and that's proof. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, J Jeremy was flabbergasted mm -hmm. that this didn't exist. Right. Know? There's there's really no shoes that leave your foot in barefoot position, you know, that don't literally take my body out of homeostasis every time I try and go run. That's like, so I'm making them, man. He's like, I don't believe you. I will go find them. And I was like, what do I know? I've just, you know, I just managed a shoe store and have worked in shoes my entire life. You know? Right. And it's not, you know, a few weeks later, a month later, he, he calls back and he's like, they don't exist. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he's like, we have to make them. And I was like, I know. <laughs> but fastest way to go homeless and he's like don't care you know like he's like i'll do everything you just you just design the shoes like worry about that i'll take care of everything else like i'll raise the money the marketing like i mean and you know naive me is like okay all right well, <laughs> you're gonna do everything like whatever man you know <laughs> anybody who knows me knows that like that's never gonna, gonna happen, happen. And for most anybody in this situation it's never gonna happen and uh you know uh, just to, we gotta we gotta wrap this up a little bit but he essentially goes and finds these guys that find these guys and these are you know this is the head of um the vp of development at adidas who had left adidas the head of the kitchen at nike who was also nike's last maker the head of Nike's advanced concepts team who had left Nike and the guy that first pioneered CAD, you know, oh, wow. for footwear design. Um, and they had formed this rapid prototyping group. And so they found out what we were doing. Jeremy found these guys that found these guys and we ended up meeting with them. And the the one guy meeting with us is like, guys, this is like a $19 million idea. <laughs> and we were like, 19 million. What an wow. interesting number. Okay, cool. Yeah. He's like, you got to meet with, uh, with Vlad and Gary and, and Joe. And um, these are guys I've mentioned before. And, you know, we go to meet with them and they're like, yeah, no, like, do you remember Adidas feet you wear? And I was like, yeah, I have a pair of the original Kobe basketball shoes. And they're like, well, that was originally designed on this exact concept. Like at Adidas, we had the research. We knew this is the way shoes should be built essentially. Um, but by the time they made it through marketing and through everything, we had to add the heel and taper the toe box. And we just tried to make them look like feet and tell people they were more, you know, foot friendly, more natural. Um, and Vlad basically said, you know, similar things at Nike had yeah. happened. And he, and they, they all basically said to us, we've known for 20 years that shoes are supposed to be built the way you're talking about here. Yeah. And it just will never happen within a traditional footwear company. And so, yeah, we should do this. But when it really came down to it, when we built the first foot shaped prototype, Vlad helped, you know, he had me design the, help him design the last. And I essentially traced people's feet that had no foot problems while wearing socks. Because you look at anybody whose feet hurt, their feet generally look more like shoes. Mm -hmm. And you look at people whose feet don't hurt, their feet tend look to like look feet. more like hands or, you know, baby feet, or, yeah. you know. Ish. Um, so they're, you know, their toes don't really touch as much. And so I'm, I'm tracing all these feet in socks. Like somebody comes into the shop, you know, do you have any foot problems? Have you ever had any foot problems? No, I haven't. Okay. Hey, right. can I trace your feet real quick? Yeah. And so I came up with this composite like shape basically and, you know, sent it to Vlad and we built the first last and we built the first shoe on it. And at this point they're all invested, like, but these guys are at the end of their careers, like, and they took one look at the shoe. And I, I remember our, our investor, my mentor, Joe Morton was there mm -hmm. and, um, and they, they just said, yeah, we love you guys. We're all in on the concept, but like, nobody's going to buy that. Like good, good luck. Foot shaped shoe. Just like, it looks too crazy. Like we're just worried. Nobody will buy it. We can't risk our life savings doing this and joe like immediately stepped up and he's like it's fine we'll pay you your going rate you don't have to be in like we'll pay you 
as much or more than than you need to be paid um and and let's keep moving and they were like okay great because we really do believe in the concept we just don't know if people will buy it and we're not willing to risk our life savings on it and you know next thing i know we're like a million dollars in debt um we go through an internal lawsuit with a one million of, years so yeah i know we got that, the five i know right <laughs> um, but this is before we've even launched, you right. know, and, um, you know, we had, we had one of our members actually sue us for more equity because he thought he was worth more. Um, we had Brian Beckstead join us. Um, and you know, he was just like such an invaluable asset to, um, and really, you know, it kind of became me, Brian and Jeremy yeah. at, at that point in time. And, and a, a few months later, you know, we landed shoes and it just, gone from there i think ultras were somewhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars today no um, no it was 19 it's got to be 19 million really i mean that's, <laughs> that's 19 it. million dollar idea yeah i um so, i had a number of people tell us four. tell us we would never get past 10 mm -hmm. and when we were at i think 40 is when i sent emails to all those people with the subject line is it too rude to say i told you so <laughs> and they were pretty <laughs> gracious I love it. I now send that email to a number of people every year. Yeah. That's um, classic. Because they keep telling us, yes, yeah, you're not going to be able to do th that thing you're saying. My favorite is they keep saying, and you you will appreciate this one, you can't keep growing at that rate. And my response is, I know it should be much faster. And they think I'm kidding. This is the exact same thing everybody would, said to me. They yeah. always say, Did you ever foresee Alter being this big? Yes. And Brian and I and Jeremy, we would always say, Bigger. We thought it would be bigger. That I didn't. I didn't foresee the funding, logistical, shipping, customs, like all this back end bullcrap stuff that mm -hmm. held us back. Because right. if it would have been pure sales and marketing, we would have been bigger. Absolutely. But it was all this logistical business junk, you know, that oh. actually held us back from. Well, and ours, bigger. you know, we keep uh, uh, selling out. I yeah. Mean, we've, the last three years, I think, we've sold out of our best sellers for like months at a time. Yeah. And absolutely um, supply. Yeah, it, it is. This is, in short, I think one of the hardest businesses you can possibly be in in the world because there are so many factors that are completely out of your control. Yeah. And I mean, look, we had a thing when uh, during the trade war and the um, uh, supply chain issue where we had stuff that was on the way here. We'd already paid to get it here. And then while the boat is on the water, suddenly there's a new tariff. Mm -hmm. and we had to pay $500,000 to get the stuff in that we had already paid for, budgeted around, mark, you know, plan for. It's like, and this is, this is, um, it's a daily occurrence. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I know. Sure so, um, holy moly, look what time it is. That's fun. Um, so, I mean, so we, we might have to do part we two, do part two about running technique, foot strengthening, all the stuff you, I'm doing now. You read my you know, mind. Talk about float so, running and absolutely. float run harness and all that we will amazing stuff. Definitely do all of that because, mm -hmm. you know, to get into the, like we could do the, the highlight film of, um, the actual running a shoe company and getting into those first stores, et cetera. Yep. In fact, let's just do that little bit. Yep. Let's do that, you know, what really got it moving part. Because after that, it's just uh, nightmarish details yeah. that you and I could have a drink over if either of us drank. And, yep. uh, and exactly. uh, we could have a beverage of some sort yeah. over um, <laughs> and and just bemoan our, bemoan our fate. I mean, because we, we both have the same experience, which is, on the one hand, most difficult thing in the world, never imagined it, never planned for it. On the other hand, people saying you changed my life. Right. And that's what gets you out of bed in the morning. All Absolutely. the rest of it is just dealing, you know, what you need to deal with yep. to change people's lives. So let's just talk about you got product in, you need to start moving it beyond your store. Yeah. What got that to happen and, you know, got the ball rolling? So we were kind of a Ponzi scheme at the beginning. <laughs> um... <laughs> Oh my god! I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, say more. So, uh, the shoes launched in March of 2011 is when the first ultras hit the market. Okay, but we had we had shown shoes previously before that. Yeah, I remember at the outdoor retailer show yep. and at the running event. Right. So we're going back, you know, as much as six months here. Like shoes had not actually been ordered. You know, um, shoes were not real yet i mean we had essentially finished them they were ready to be ordered and but we we needed to you know prove it and so right. at the running event we actually signed up 19 retailers on the spot that wrote orders for us wow so we got we got orders from 19 retailers at the running event and we said you know hey we've got about 20 accounts now they have pre-orders in you know does this 
feel like we can spend the money on ordering the shoes now. Like, yes, it does. Now, of course, to those retailers at the time, we were like, oh, yeah, no problem. Shoes are coming. It's all good. So we really were a Ponzi scheme. Oh, you know, man. it was it was really this idea of like, you know, we'll collect the orders and then that will give us the ammunition we need to spend the money on right. actually ordering the product. And, um, and that's exactly what happened. And so uh, that first shipment came and uh, it was about you know about three thousand pair and um we shipped out the pre-orders uh wait let me pause uh yeah. and i don't know i'm not suggesting that you have an answer to this question but i'll yeah. ask it as if i know or as if you do um how many things did you see that were wrong the moment you opened the first box oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard for somebody that like me that's a perfectionist and a, a tweaker like uh oh Yes, you were preaching. Brutal a moment. Um, at, luckily, there was enough Ponzi scheme time in between that I had a lot of time to kind of do that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Beforehand, but yeah, that, of course, I want them to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yes, that happened. Um, but uh, the so you yeah. had those so, so we shipped out the pre-orders to the yeah. nineteen. We had added a few more in the meantime, and that whole shipment was gone in three weeks. Right. Um, we knew this was probably going to happen. So we had reordered in the meantime, which is, which is actually how we ended up, you know, that million dollars in debt was actually just pre-ordering all this inventory and it kind of snowballed from there. And realistically, I've been in about 700 of the thousand ish running stores in the country personally. Yeah. And, uh, at the time, what we did is I was, I was doing China development trips and, you know, running the day to day of the company. And so Brian and Jeremy hopped in a car and they drove from, you know, the mountains here to northerly to the East Coast, then down the Eastern seaboard, then back along the South and back. And then they did a second road trip that did for the West Coast. And so they did this giant figure eight um, in two, two trips, basically. The first trip was like, uh, I think about a month. It was the East Coast swing visiting, you know, several shops a day, essentially, if possible. Um, and basically, you know, just go in there and, hey, this is the concept. We believe in it. We know it works. Here's the testimonials. It's different than anything else you got. It's unique. It's very run specialty. Um, you know, here's what it is. Um, please give us money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you bat maybe one in five, one in six at the time, I'm guessing. But yeah, I've got a lot of accounts out of that. And then same thing with the West Coast road trip. And we just basically, that was the mantra. It was like, there's no way we're going to get this without in-person visits, yeah. like personal relationships. And luckily, like we had street cred, you know, Brian was this, you know, accomplished ultra marathoner, which was still fairly new at the time. Um, and, you know, I have all of my credentials and state, national, world best, all American running, et cetera. Um, which we didn't even get to talk about the fun, you know, the fun part of my running as a, as a kid true. that kind of leads into this stuff. But um, we, we alluded to and, it. Um, so it's like we, we kind of had the chops and, and yeah. the running store history. Yeah. And we could talk to these people on their level in their language. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it's like, how do you, how do you reproduce that? Like right. other people, there are other people that can do that, but it kind of had to be that type of person. Well, this is the thing, you know, the you go into a store and most people don't realize that the average running the shoe store they go into it's a tiny store and the people who own it slash run it are scraping by you know they don't make a lot these stores do not make a lot of money mm -hmm. and the, the only way ones. yeah yeah and the only way that you're going to be able to get in there is to make it clear to them that without a lot of work, they can make some more money. If they have to change their mind, if they have to learn some big new thing, if it's going to be difficult, if it's going to make it so they look at the wall and go, I can't sell these things that have been my bread and butter, then they're going to walk away. But yeah. because you had that credibility of having like the, just the experience in the store, let alone the product, the product um, that would, I imagine, just give them, not everyone obviously, but give the ones who are willing to listen enough uh, an understanding that you've already walked the walk mm -hmm. and so you have information that they could use and if they if that if they feel like that fits with them then it's simple because yeah. you're not making them do anything different but you're giving them a map that they can follow to get to you know some new end result yeah. which which is uh, an, an incredible 
not feat, it, pun intended. It's an incredible thing, again, to be able to give someone essentially a business in a box. Yeah. Um, and that's that worked to your advantage tremendously. And we looked at the shoes as a running technique coach in a box, right. you know. Um, yeah. And we essentially, and this will maybe lead into our next session, but uh, we essentially went in saying, look, everything else you sell promises cushioning will save people's joints. We're here to say that the research says that proper running variation in running technique um, will save your joints. And here's a shoe that promotes that. And right. so you don't really have to change your fit process as much as just tell the customer, this shoe is going to help you run better. And that is likely to help you move better and and um, have less forces on your joints, essentially. The, uh, and by the way, it's comfortable. And at the end of the day, comfort is what matters. Yep. And you can just insert it into your fit process and just say, you know, is it more comfortable? You don't even have to say anything about it. You yeah. Know? There, um, there is so. an irony that um, if they had really thought it through even, you know, one step more fully, mm -hmm. um, they would have thought, wait a minute, that means that people aren't going to come back every six months to buy the latest thing that some big shoe company is saying is the newest, greatest fill in the blank. Huh. Yeah. Um, so now they'll build more loyal customers and those people will tell their friends and they'll tell two friends and right. so on until everyone's shampooing. And that was actually our pitch. Yep. yep. That was definitely our pitch. This is the, this is the pitch we make to people like uh, chiropractors, physical therapists, um, yep. whomever else. Like, yeah, you're going to get, get people out of the door faster. But then they're going to tell their friends they got out of the door faster. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you're not going to be seeing the same person every day for the rest of their life. You're going to be seeing them for just a referral little bit. Referral after referral after mm -hmm. referral. Yeah. And that's way more valuable to have that kind of a reputation. And some people get that and some people that terrifies them. I don't think it would work today. Really? Um, at the same level because... Uh, running stores have fundamentally changed oh, over well, the last no, 20 years. Uh, uh, running stores. I was um, thinking more like the... PPs. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, it totally works. No, there. you're absolutely right. Um, you used to have a lot of mom-pop running shops mm -hmm. with a lot of owners that actually cared. Right. And I, I'm not like trying to disparage running stores in general or say that this doesn't happen today, but running stores have become far more corporate over right. the last 15-ish years, 15, 20 years, um, and really 15 and your average running store is bigger now. Mm -hmm. It is corporate. Um, you know, you may not know this, but your local fleet feet, there's, you know, there's almost 200 of those across the nation. Yeah. Um, a lot of your running stores that you think, you know, we all grew up, you know, in, in Colorado, Boulder running company was, yeah. was a big local thing. And that's, that's actually part of a big national conglomerate, yeah. you know, now, uh, which it wasn't back then. Um, and it really is for, Unfortunately, for the vast majority of running stores today, it is just a business that happens to sell running shoes. Yeah. And it wasn't that way as much 15 years ago. It used to be you had these like running nerd people that were scraping by because they loved running and they weren't great at business, mm -mm. but they, they actually cared about people. But even um, the ones who were pretty good at business, it's mm -hmm. still, you know, it's a tough business. The inventory yeah. requirements are high. Absolutely. Um the you know just the, what it takes to market is is challenging the thing that's fascinating on the corporate side we have uh, i mean the corporations will have an opinion for whatever reason and that gets spread down to almost all of the franchises yep. and um i met someone actually i won't mention which franchise she's part of she's one of our top affiliates because anytime somebody walks in she'll say uh go buy a pair of zero shoes and and somehow she still has a job mm -hmm. uh, i don't know how she's pulled that off one of our employees he was on the floor at REI and switched our shoes. All those things that you described happening happened for him. Everything got better. And um, same thing. We used to have people every day coming up to our store saying, yeah, they just sent us here from REI. Because even when REI started carrying some of our product, they only had a couple. Right. And so they still got sent up to us. And so it is this really weird push me, pull you thing. I mean, the irony, just for the sake of doing the world's fastest thing about the inside world of the footwear biz, is that A... Our job as a direct-to-consumer company, or primarily direct-to-consumer company, started as a direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. company, is to get into retail so we can fundamentally steal their customers. Because they're not going to carry every product we make, right. so we want to get them hip to what we're doing and then join us. Now, if people would just say that out loud to each other, then it's really easy because we could help each other grow both businesses, which right. helps everybody. As long as that's an unspoken truth, the it feels like there's some fight between us doing direct to consumer and what they're doing on the retail side right we could get data that would help them they could get data that would help us it would literally make i mean we we advertise for our retail partners which 
most people don't. During right. COVID, when people were shutting down, we were getting orders from some of these stores because we were driving traffic to them because we wanted them to stay alive and nobody else was doing things like that. So it is, the, and and the, with the corporatification of all of this, that just adds another few layers that get in the way of doing it in a way that could uh, really, really help people. Yeah. Um, we hear from that all the time. So like, much. you know, um, yeah, no, we're okay. You don't need to help us in some way. It's like, you're not doing any real marketing. Um, we just sold a few thousand pairs to people within 20 miles of where you are. And we're happy to drive them to your store for an event if you help us out as well. And they're like, eh, no, it's okay. It's like, I, I don't know which part of, we just, you know, sold a thousand pairs of shoes over a weekend by doing something similar is confusing to you. Yeah. So it really, it, and again, this just goes back to everything we've been saying. People get set in their ways and they're set in their ways. Yeah. And it happens from the consumer all the way up the chain. Absolutely. Um, and some, I mean, I do, somebody asked me recently and I want to ask you the same question. Actually, I'll, I'll ask you first. Um, if you, if you're going to be remembered for something, what would you like it to be? Is this within business or shoes? Or oh, you can or do both. Life well, in general. If they're, you can do all three of those if they're different. Wow. Boy, okay. In business, my dad always taught me growing up that we would do what was best for the customer, regardless of whether it made us money or not. And I always took that to heart. And so I hope people still feel that way. And I, I hope I have lived up to that as much as I can. Um, and I, I still, I still live by that Yeah. within the shoe world and ultra, you know, I, I hope I rem am remembered as maybe the guy who brought getting your foot in barefoot position and using your body naturally and learning good technique and, and knowing that foot strength is important to kind of the masses, you yeah. know? Um, and for some people being, uh, where they, where they land and where they want to be. And for others being a gateway to gateway drug to, you know, um, to shoes that are even more, you know, barefoot style or like whatever. Like who, for example. Um, yeah, like, like exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, on, on just a general level, like, I think I just, you know, for me, it's like, I just want to be remembered as somebody who was kind and who cared and, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better term, I don't know how to describe it. within my like realm, someone who lived a Christ-like life, um, which for me is is the you know I'm going to love everybody regardless of of who they are and where they're from as much as I can, and um, try and you know uh, do my best to just do what's right by people. And, and, you know, it's like, I, I tell my daughter, you know, as she's going off to school, you know, in the mornings, like, Hey, make somebody smile today or, mm -hmm. or find somebody to, to, to help out today or make, do something to make somebody's life better today. Um, and that's, it's easier said than done. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so, I would just settle for not being mad at the person who's driving 10 miles under the speed limit in front of me. Yeah. If I could do that one, then I think, <laughs> I think I could die, you know, fully content that I have maximized my, my value on this planet yeah, yeah, yeah. By, by not sending out those psychic signals that I hope somebody picks up. Yeah. Um, that'd be a good one. Uh, of course I, I, I have to, I don't have to, but I can't resist doing the joke. So you and I have the same goal as like emulator, emulate a really good Jew. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah i love it <laughs> um no that's that's, awesome. that's it's great i mean you know it, it is interesting we are at the forefront of something and i mean i'm gonna get teary when i say it i hope that we see the results of what we've been working on for both of us yeah. and the people around us for the last 15 years um I hope we get to live long enough to see that it's really made an impact bigger than what we hear all day, every day from our customers, yeah. but like an actual impact where we're changing an industry to be better for the people yeah. the fruit that industry serves. If we, you know, I've been saying, I want to do everything in my power to try and change the world before I die. And, yeah. and changing the world is not that everyone's going to be doing what we're doing. That's completely unreasonable. Right. But um, where this becomes something that people don't see as a, fad or goofy or uh i mean where it becomes an accepted option it's a legitimate path yeah 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 if we could do that before we die that'd be good yeah absolutely and i think man it's it's a long road like 
to change is hard for people. It's uh, well, you know, it, it, it is, and it isn't, it, it's hard for individuals. Yeah. Um, and, but what happens, the amazing thing is in a group, once you get over 25% of that group, then things pop to like 75, 80 pretty quickly. Yeah. So given that we're dealing with so many different groups, um, I see that as a real possibility. And with, yeah. with the magic of the internet and the problems of the internet, um, the ability to get to more people and create a group or create groups or find groups is greater than it's ever been. So right. yes, it is still difficult. People do not want to change their minds. We're not wired to do that. We're wired to do the opposite of that. But as, as something you alluded to a number of times, the experience of what we're doing, we are, is so profound that that's what makes people's minds change is when their own experience undermines what they've been led to believe. Yeah. And not everyone, but the majority of people can't argue with, oh my God, this is more comfortable. Oh my God, my fill in the blank went away. Yeah. Um, and and then, it be, then the only problem is having them uh, not shout from the rooftops and offend their friends at dinner parties. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I think, I think the reality is that it works. Exactly. And like, I am not at Alter anymore. I have zero affiliation with Alter whatsoever at the moment. Right. Um, and I still, I still, whether I like it or not, I spend seven to 15 hours a week being talking that, about Ultra. Being we, that guy. We did it today. Yeah. Um, and I, I would be tearing it down if I didn't believe in it, yeah. you know? And it's like, even though I have no official affiliation, you know, I, I promote it, you know, but I promote all everything in this sphere, you know, it's, good running technique, yeah. foot strengthening, you know, natural shoes in general. Like I'm, I'm fairly, you know, brand agnostic in that way. Like I, I think the best, the worst thing we can do is be like the regular shoe companies who are all very combative and, you know, like yeah. the, the shoe world is, is not friendly. Um, but people don't know this. We're, we're on this healthy feet Alliance board thing together. And um, a lot of the, influencers in the natural footwear world we used to get together and we share ideas and we help each other out and we work collaboratively yeah and it doesn't matter that you know i might be slightly biased slightly i might be biased towards <laughs> alter and you might be biased towards zero it's fine the thing is when i see somebody wearing a pair of zeros when i'm out and about and you know i will literally run by somebody on the on the trail wearing a pair of zero shoes and as i'm running by i say nice natural footwear you know like <laughs> like it's just like well, I can't help myself. Like, I love it when I see people that are like moving naturally and, yeah. and getting the benefit of just using their bodies the way our bodies were created and intended to be used in the first place. You know? Yeah. So. It's, I, I feel the same way. I mean, the, the my thought is um, uh, for me, business is a lot like the way I am on the track. And what I mean is at the beginning of a race and I'm a 60 meter indoor, hundred meter outdoor guy, there's invariably a whole bunch of guys who are much bigger than I am, because um, uh, I'm not that big, who like very seriously, very aggressively is like, hey man, have a really good race. And I go, look, there's no prize money involved. There's no real rewards for this. So I want you to have a good time, stay healthy, have fun. And oh, by the way, I totally want to kick your ass. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I don't need to, we don't need to be the biggest whatever, but we are definitely trying to you know, build something yeah. um, as big as we can. And when people say, what do you think about the competition? I go, great. It's just spreading the awareness of what we're all doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, the more the merrier, frankly. Well, and I'll, I'll give an example is uh, when Tony Post first came out with Topos, he had this split toe shoe. Right. And I was actually developing one at Alter because there is a mechanical advantage Makes to sense. having your big toe forced to be straight, essentially. Um, people need that. And now I'm a huge proponent of correctos as a result. But um, when this came out, I was, I was like, wow, that's awesome. I'm glad he did that. Like, so I just scrapped my prototype and we stopped working on it. Cause I was like, that's fine. Done. Somebody else, somebody else already did it. That's yeah. cool. And, and that actually ended up getting taken down by socks. Like you have to have separate socks right. for that. And he had to ship socks with the shoes and the socks weren't great. And it kind of killed the whole project, which was really sad to me. Um, it was a little more to then, it than that, but yeah, yeah, there were a lot of things, a lot of moving parts, but um, essentially they moved on from those and the next round of Topos were pretty much a direct alter. Ultra -esque. Like they were, I mean, you could have swapped logos and it was pretty close at the time. And um, I remember we had some people within alter that were just so pissed off at Topo, so angry. And 
I was like, yes, <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> and, and everybody's like, why are you happy about Topo ripping us off? I was like, cause they just straight up legitimized us. Yeah. Like they legitimized us. They made us, they, they said, look, what Alter is doing is legit and we're doing it now too. Like, I love that. And frankly, the more people doing good stuff, the better, yeah. because there's always going to be different feet, different yeah. fits. Well, people, well, people want different amounts of cushioning or different, Something. you know, whatever it is. People say, what, what would, you know, how'd you feel if Nike ripped you off? I went, then we won. Yeah, exactly. I mean, end of story. Absolutely. So yeah, no, on I, that think that, I think that's kind of where I just say like, yeah. uh, that's why I'm happy when I see people wearing any type of natural footwear. Yeah. It's like, to me, it's not like, it's not about alter. It's not about zero. It's about getting people into healthy, functional footwear and helping people move better, feel better, live better, all that stuff, you know? Live life feet first beliefs. So, exactly. You know, one of those things that I might say in about 30 seconds. <laughs> so uh, Golden, as always a pleasure, we will do uh, part two. So we did pet chapters one through like six. We'll do seven through wherever that goes. Um, but anyway, uh, A, thank you to you. And by the way, you know, this is in our office, not a new thing. We're here. Yeah, we're here. Uh, <laughs> a reminder. Um, so wait, is there anything, uh, even though we're going to be talking about it in another thing, if mm -hmm. anybody wants to check out what you're up to now, how can they do that? Yeah. So uh, goldenharper.net for just general running information. PR gear is my new company. And we do uh, foot health and running technique uh, improvement accessories. And uh, the educational arm of that is floatrun.com and what we call float running. And that's just teaching people how to run with efficient low impact technique. And we have this awesome product called the float run harness, which we'll talk about next time and maybe demo how it works. But mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing, you know, the average person, we can put this thing on them. And instead of spending a two hour running technique lesson, it's 30 seconds and we just tell them don't stretch the thumb loops, focus on getting your elbows back. They stop over striding, they land right. It makes it much easier to adapt to natural footwear. And the bonuses are people aren't over striding, they're not blowing up their joints, they're getting injured less. And our average reviewer right now, believe it or not, on, on the website, there's not a lot because um, this is new, but 30 seconds a mile faster. Oh, people wow. are literally paying three to five hundred dollars for a pair of super shoes that make them one to two seconds a mile faster at the expense of them getting injured down the road when they could be paying twelve dollars for a float run harness right um that is making them at least two seconds faster if not you know we have one reviewer that said they're a minute faster a mile uh, these are people that have a lot of you know running technique work to be done of course yeah. But just to me, like, uh, it's the coolest thing I've ever built it's really uh, because shoes are really individual. This works for just about anybody. Um, and it can work with any shoe too. So simple item. Um, so that's what I'm up to floatrun.com or prgear.co, prgear.co, um, or is Harper .net. Yeah. yep. That's, that's Beautiful. what we're doing right now. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah. And so for us again, uh, go check out our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find previous episodes, all the ways you can engage with us uh, on social media and other places to get the podcast. And if you want to drop me a note with any requests, what's the word is like more requests, uh, complaints, uh, compliments, whatever comments, uh, comments. comments. That was a word I couldn't find. Yep. And, or if you know someone who want, you think should be on the show, especially if you know someone who thinks, that either I or Golden have cranial rectal reorientation syndrome. That would be <laughs> super, super fun. Uh, and you can always drop me an email for that or anything else at move, M-O-V-E, at jointhemovementmovement.com. And until then, just go out, have fun, and live Enjoy. like feet first. <laughs>